Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. Please let us know that you're with us today. Send us an email, memprez at gmail.com, or you can text Pastor Shannon, or you can call someone. Leave us a comment online. We'd love to know how you're joining us in worship each week. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 66, verses 1 through 6. Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Come and see what God has done. How awesome. His works in man's behalf. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. Our prayer of the people this morning. Please join me in uh, that prayer. O oh Lord, we thank you for the beauty of your world, for the beauty of these sanctuaries that bless our worship. In days when it was dangerous to be known as a Christian, the followers of Jesus resorted to secret signs and symbols to avoid exposing themselves unnecessarily to the foes of Christianity. Christians had to worship in secret and use symbols to guide others to their place of worship. We're thankful that we can openly practice our religion that today these symbols are meaningful ornaments and add to the beauty and the inspiration of worshiping thee. Give us courage to be your people of faith. And now, leaning into the words you give us, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Jan. And now time for uh, faith with our children. Today we're going to talk about some Christian symbols. And symbols were carved on walls or in tombs to express something people felt or they believed in their heart. A symbol, a symbol pardon me, is something that stands for something else. So let's look at the cross. What do you think that stands for or what does it mean to you? Well, it, may rep it definitely represents Christianity. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We may look at the cross and think of Jesus. The cross is probably one of the most sacred and most important symbols used in churches. There are all kinds and types of crosses and each one represents something different. Today we're going to talk about some other things in addition to crosses. So as we go through the lesson today, you watch the pictures and see each of the symbols and listen for their meaning. And then when you're here in a church in person, you look around and see what other symbols you can find or if you can find those we've talked about. Our scripture this morning is from Galatians 6, 14 through 18. Stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. A lot of us learn visually as well as auditorily. Some lean more one way than the other. We're very visual people though, and so we see things and we attach meaning to them. So we're going to start first by looking at the church building itself and some of the features and parts of the ancient cathedrals and how they manifest themselves in our modern churches. Medieval churches were in the shape of a cross. They were patterned after the Latin cross. And churches today have some of those very same components. For instance, the chancel seen at the very top of the slide is the area above the cross arms usually used by the ministers and the choir. Sometimes it's separated from the rest of the church with a rail or an altar rail. Below that is what's called the transept or the arms of the cross. It's used for seating some worshipers and also the lectern and the pulpit. Now, our church here is, is modified, but you can see those same features with the chancel being that back area, this being a little bit of the transept, and then the nave is the next part, and that's the main body where most of the congregation sits. Uh, the nave comes from the Latin word navus, meaning ship. And then there's the narthex, which is at the very back or at the very bottom of your screen there. It's an enclosed passage between the main entrance and the actual nave. So now let's go from the building to some of the icons and the symbols within it. The church has used symbols and icons and stained glass, steeples, crosses, vestments, the clothes, and so on to remind us of who Christ is and what he's done for us. After remembering who he is, we will hopefully respond faithfully through our lives and ministries. Originally, icons were used to allow the viewer to understand the religion more and to be clear on religious lessons. There were wood carvings, and were religious icons, depicting one of the stations of the cross. And then you see the other symbol that I have there, and that's the doors of the Blue Rapids Church with a Celtic cross on it. They serve as mediums of instruction. They started out to be that way because in medieval times, so many of the people did not read or write, they were illiterate. So this was a way to reinforce whatever was being said in the church with the pictures. 
So icons were used to help teach them about the Bible. And those icons can be mosaics made of small tiles. They can be frescoes painted on wet clay, engravings on metal or wood, or wood or prints on paper. Christian symbols appear on doors, they appear on the end of pews, on altars, hymnals, communion tables, pulpit, Bibles, the paraments, you know, the, all the cloths that we talked about last week that adorn the Bible and the pulpit and the altar. Uh, so they, they are on all kinds of things, all kinds of uh, objects. And uh, if, you, if you're tuned into that, you kind of notice things more, I think, in the church once you, once you know a little bit of their meaning. Next, I'd like to start with a familiar symbol that you see often today. It's on books and it's on garments and it's on banners, it's on jewelry, and it's the official symbol of the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America, PCUSA, after its reunification in 1983. The seals were designed by Malcolm Greer and was ratified by the General Assembly in 1985. It teaches people the meaning of the Presbyterian tradition. It helps us to understand the content and the imagery of the Bible and some of the abstractions of doctrine and theology. So the first thing we see is the cross. The cross represents the incarnate love of God in, in Jesus Christ and his passion and resurrection. Because of its association with Presbyterian history, the Celtic cross was chosen. And then you see the dove at the top, the uppermost section, the shape of a, of a descending dove, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It also symbolizes Christ's baptism by John, the peace and the wholeness with his death and resurrection, bringing to a broken world. And then the next thing that we see if we look at that symbol is the Bible. The two center lines of the cross represent an open book, the role of scripture as a means of knowing God's word. And then we see beneath the image of the book is the suggestion of a lectern or a pulpit, which captures the important role of preaching in the, men, in the history of Presbyterian worship. Now the flame is integrated into the lower part of the design. The flames convey a double meaning, a symbol of revelation in the Old Testament when God spoke to Moses from the burning bush, and the beginning of the Christian church when Christ manifested himself to his apostles at Pentecost and charged them to be messengers of the good news of God's love. Also, the flames form a triangle, a traditional symbol of the Trinity. I couldn't see that until I saw this picture, but once you kind of get the outline of it, then you can see that. The triangle also suggests the nature of Presbyterian government with its concern for balance and order, dividing authority between ministers of the word and lay persons and between different governing bodies. It's also symbolic of the Trinity. And then we go to the fish in the shape of the descending dove. You can see the fish there in blue. And one can discern that, that uh, fish, it was an early Christian sign for Christ, recalling his ministry to those who hunger. Then we see on that same slide, we see uh, the font or the chalice. In the lower central part of the image of the cross, one can find a baptismal font or a communion chalice, both images of sacraments, an ongoing sign and symbol of God's presence with us and working through us. So that is the Presbyterian seal. You'll find it on a lot of, a lot of items, a lot of documents and t-shirts and books and so on. Now, I hope we've discovered a, a lot more to it than when you first see it at first glance. It's a lot more hidden in this particular symbol, isn't there? So now let's move to symbols commonly found around the church. Symbols are the sign language of our faith, if you will. IHS is a monogram just as our initials are the first letters of our names as a, as a monogram except this is the first three letters of the Greek spelling for Jesus. It's often found on various church cloths, paraments, such as the ones for the Bible, the pulpit, or the altar. 
and uh, sometimes on candlesticks or candelabras. So IHS stands for Jesus. And you can see the, uh, the Blue Rapids Bible there with IHS on it. And I believe the other picture is from, I believe it's the Marysville Church that has the IHS cross. Uh, and then another similar monogram is the INRI, I dot N dot R dot I. These letters indicate the Latin inscription, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judicrum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This inscription is shown in accordance with John 19, 19 through 22. Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And then we have the Cairo, a monogram of the first two letters. Chi is the X, Rho is the P of the Greek word for Christ. These are superimposed on, on top, one on top of the other. And then we see the Alpha and Omega, often used on our altars and pulpit hangings. It stands for Christ who says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Hebrews 13, 8, and Revelations 1, 8. And then this is the Flyfoot Cross or the Swastika. Now, I'm throwing this in because I thought it was really interesting and very unusual. This symbol existed way before Nazism. It was a pagan symbol used by early Christians in the catacombs. Those were the underground tombs of Rome. And my thinking is that maybe it was adopted as a pagan symbol to simply throw off anyone that was tracking those Christians that were, that were meeting in the catacombs. During the second and the third century, some authorities say the swastika was the only form of cross used by the Christians. It's made both clockwise and it's also, uh, there's also one that's counterclockwise. And then we come next to the Trinity, which means three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Here we see the triangle, all sides equal, the interwoven circles, co-eternal nature of Trinity, and then the circle and the triangle speak uh, blended together speak to the eternity of the triangle. And so you can see some representations of that. Uh, three different forms, but you can see the circles and you can see the triangle in various aspects of, of the, uh, the three pictures there. And then we go to the church. And we sometimes lose sight of the church in the midst of all our denominations. When Christ used the term my church. He refers to the group of all believers in him. His church throughout the world. The symbol is the ship. It recalls to us the story of the storm on the Sea of Galilee when the disciples were afraid and Jesus calmed the sea. The symbol of the ship is also to remind us that even though life is filled with many storms and troubles of one kind or another, Jesus is always near to help and protect those who trust in him. Many churches in the Scandinavian countries have a ship hanging, literally hanging somewhere uh, in the rafters as a reminder of Jesus' care and protection for his world church. Ships, of course, are a part of, very much a part of the Scandinavian Norse heritage. We saw one when we were visiting in Sweden, and I didn't really know this aspect of, of uh, Christian symbolism at that point, and I thought it was hanging up there in the open rafters, just tied into their heritage and their culture until I later did the research and, and discovered it, it has a symbolic meaning uh, to be the church. Another important part of the ship is the mast. Sailing ships could not sail without a mast. The church would not exist without Christ's death on the cross. So the cross is seen in all churches in one form or another. Now I could go on with more, especially on the different designs of the cross and what they represent. But we'll save that for another time. Hopefully you've learned a little something that will make you look around the church a little bit, be inspired by some of the symbols that you do see. Let us go to prayer at this time. Lord, we thank you for this church. 
for all the varied symbols and the components that speak to us of our faith. As we learn more about their meanings and their relevance for us today, help us to pause and worship Thee. Come, Holy Spirit, enter our hearts. Open our minds to Thy teachings. Amen. At this time, we will have our, our offering and our responsive music, and there are... Uh, there's information provided for you on one of the latter slides about how to contribute if you'd like to. be used to honor thee and to serve thee. Amen. And now for our benediction. We go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. He has a purpose for us being there. Christ lives in us and has something he wants to do through us. We believe this and go in his grace, his love, and his power. Amen. Amen.